Well, good morning, everybody. And uh, it's a special morning. You know, to me, it's special any time I get to stand in front of you and share from God's Word. But it's also a morning where we're taking a look at a holiday. And uh, this is the very day, Veterans Day. And so I'd just like to recognize all the veterans who are present here at congregation. If you've served in our armed services, either in the service or the reserves, uh, please stand up. We'd like to thank you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. Well, on behalf of a grateful nation, we're a grateful congregation, and we want to thank you. We, we understand it very plainly, that there's all kinds of liberties and freedoms that we enjoy, that we've never paid the price that you have paid on our behalf, and we're super, super grateful. And so we just say thank you, and I'd like to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. And, uh, and just gratitude to God for our veterans and for their work. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord. I, I, I feel safer already, Lord, knowing there's all these veterans here in our congregation. And Lord, we, we do thank you for the work that they do and have done, for the way that they have honored you, Lord, and honored our nation, our community, because it's true, Lord, there's freedoms that we enjoy Father, they have worked hard to provide for us. And so, Lord, we pray that you'd put a blessing upon our veterans. We pray that you'd put a blessing on families that are connected right now to the military by a brother or a sister or a mother or a father or a daughter or a son. Lord, we pray for all of your goodness to be upon them. We pray that you would give our veterans Lord, the totally appropriate satisfaction for the service that they have performed unto their nation, unto their community, and unto you. Bless them, Lord. And bless us this morning as we give attention to your word and its power in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah, go ahead. Well, with that, I'd like you to open up your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 18. I hope that you bring a Bible with you. It's very helpful because um, what I want you to see is that what I speak to you on a Sunday morning, it, it's really only um, important and relevant as much as it just brings to you what the scriptures themselves are saying. And so I think that the best way to hear what I or someone else would have to say in, in this situation is with an open Bible, with an open heart, and to see what God would speak to you this morning. We're following the people of Israel as they make their way out of Egypt towards the promised land. I don't mean to disappoint anybody, but by the time we get to the end of the book of Exodus, they're still going to be in the wilderness. They're not going to be the promised land yet. But uh, it's on the horizon and they're in the right direction. So far along the journey, of course, they came out in a very dramatic way from Egypt. God had to send forth supernatural power, supernatural deliverance to bring them out of the slavery they were in and to set them on the course of freedom and in the direction of their permanent possession in the promised land. But along the way, God had an important place for them to stop. Now, we're going to talk a lot more about this next week because next week we're really going to focus on their coming to Mount Sinai. They've already arrived to Mount Sinai here in chapter 18, but that's not the focus of the chapter. The focus on the chapter has to do, well, let's put it this way, has to do with a visit from the in-laws. That's what happened with Moses. His father-in-law came for a visit and gave him some advice that had a huge impact on Moses personally and upon Israel as a whole. And we'll look at that together starting now at verse 1. And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. 
Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and with her two sons with her. Well, we see it right here just at the very beginning. Verse 1 opens up sort of the direction, the theme. It has to do with this man named Jethro, who was the father of Moses' wife. Therefore, of course, Moses' father-in-law. And he was, as verse 1 says, the priest of Midian. You say, well, what does that even mean, the priest of Midian? It means this that Jethro, who we've already been introduced to in the book of Exodus, way back in chapter uh, 3, Jethro shows us that there were worshipers of the true God who were not properly part of Israel. And it makes sense that Jethro would be just one of these people, because if you follow the family line of Jethro back up through the generations, you'll eventually get to Abraham. Abraham, after the death of Sarah, his wife, married another woman. Many people neglect this. They don't really remember this. But Abraham married another woman. Her name was Keturah. And one of the sons that Keturah had was named Midian. And from him came the Midianites, of whom Jethro was one. And so this family heritage of the worship of the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, was passed down through the generations to a man like Jethro. So he wasn't of Israel, yet he still was a, a man who recognized and was indeed a priest of the true God, the Most High God. So he came and had this visit with Moses. He comes and he brings Moses' his wife. Uh, the two sons of Moses who apparently had been sent back for safekeeping to their father-in-law in the time when all this stuff was happening with the plagues and all the, the, the calamity coming upon Egypt. And so he says, here I am, I'm coming to you, let's have a visit. Well, verse 7, so Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down and kissed him. And when they asked each other about their well-being and they went into the tent, and Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way and how the Lord had delivered them. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done from Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. So what happens? Well, they get together. The in-laws come over, and I'm sure you greet your in-laws the same way when they come for a visit. Verse 7, Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, and kissed him. Isn't that the way you greet your in-laws when they come over for a visit? Come on now, Thanksgiving's coming up. This gives you a few ideas. Well, look, not everybody has the same happy relationship with their in-laws that Moses had with his own or that I would say I'm fortunate to have with the parents of my wife and her family. But Moses had this, and one thing I just want you to see, you know, look, I, I, I don't claim to, for a moment to be able to speak into or understand all the family dynamics that you have and enter into or perhaps have endured or do endure in your life, but I will say this, that perhaps it's a good thing to honor your in-law's family just the way that Moses did. I mean, Moses was a big, important man. Well, sure, Jethro, his father-in-law, was the priest of Midian and had his own thing going on. But look, he was simply a large, successful farmer, a herdsman. What was Moses? Moses was the leader of a nation of two million people. Yet Moses goes out and he greets him and he honors him by bowing down to him. He honors him by showing him hospitality. When Moses, in, in, in sort of one way of thinking, had every reason to say, listen, you should be bowing down to me. I'm like the, the leader of a whole nation. You're just a, the leader of a family. But yet Moses said, no, I'm going to go and I'm going to honor that man. I'm going to show him that he deserves honor, not so much for his status or his position, but, but he deserves honor because he's the mother of my, my wife. Excuse me, he's the father of my wife. He deserves honor because he's the grandfather of my children. And so he honored him. 
But I also like what it says there in verse 8. It says there that he told him all the hardship and how the Lord had delivered him. I love how it just was honest with him. Hey, Jethro, let me tell you how it's been really difficult on the way out of Egypt. But then let me tell you how God has done marvelous things. And this is exactly what he told him so much so that in verse 11, Jethro's response is to say, Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods. I think it's wonderful to see that Jethro, even though he was a worshiper of the true God, he was a priest of the true God, he lived all around people who worshiped uh, different gods, pagan gods all around. There was the God of this and the God of that. And Jethro had the common sense to say, no, there's one God and I'm going to worship him. But, but when he saw God exalt himself, it just encouraged him all the more to say, yes, now I know that the Lord, he is the true God. Well, now, starting at verse 13, Jethro is going to give some advice to Moses. Look at how it unfolds. It says, And so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people. And the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, What is this thing that you're doing for the people? Why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? And Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me, and I judge between one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So you get the picture? Uh, Jethro comes and they have a nice visit and they enjoy a meal and then Moses gets up from work in the morning and Jethro goes, well, I got nothing to do. I'm just visiting my son-in-law. I'll go with him to work and see what happens. Moses sits down early in the morning and he sits down at some appointed place there at the camp of Israel and there begins a line. People start taking numbers. Number one, number two, it gets up to about a number of thousand in the day. And what is it when each person has a number? They come before Moses and two people come up with some dispute. Today you would say it's a lawsuit, it's a small claims court, it's a, it's a trial on, for some crime that's been committed, whatever it is, some dispute that would normally be settled in some kind of law court or mediation board or something like that comes before Moses. Uh, this man stole my sheep. No, I didn't steal his sheep. Well, it was mine to begin with. Well, no, it wasn't. You gave it to me on and on and on. And it was Moses' job to discern between the two and make a judgment. Why was it Moses' job? Well, number one, he was the leader of Israel. He couldn't just say, I don't care about your problems. He had a heart for the people. He wanted to help them. But number two, it was Moses' job because he knew the word of God and he had the wisdom of God. He was able to say, I understand these principles from God's law, God's word. I can apply them to your specific situation. And so that was to help me in this job of judging. So Moses had the heart to do it. Moses had the ability to do it. And so naturally people came to him. Here was the great problem. Moses did this in this very official way. By the way, if you take those phrases, Moses sat to judge and the people stood before Moses. Those are technical terms of ancient law. It's sort of like the all rise when the judge comes in the room. It's kind of like be seated and give your testimony in the court of law. These are technical terms. And when Moses did all this, the problem was that he was doing it alone. And Jethro's watching all this. And Jethro goes, Moses, you don't even get a lunch break. You don't even get a coffee break. What's going on? You're being worked to death. And when the day's done, there's still hundreds of people waiting to see you. There's people who've been backed up in line for days, for weeks, for months, waiting to see you. The people aren't being served well. And Moses, you're exhausted at the end of the day. And let me tell you, sometimes there can be nothing more exhausting than trying to mediate in a dispute between two people. Well, so this was Moses' job, but it was very difficult upon him. So now, verse 17, so Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you do, uh, he said, the thing that you do is not good. Both you and the people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out, for this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. You get the point here? Not good. The thing which you do is not good. Now, it wasn't that Moses was unfit to hear these disputes. No, that's not the idea at all. He was perfectly fit to hear the disputes. It wasn't that he didn't care. He did care. It wasn't that the job was beneath him. Oh, no, it wasn't like, well, you know, your problems are too small for an important man like Moses. No, that wasn't the idea at all. Moses loved to serve the people. No, the difficulty was that the job was simply too big for Moses to do. 
The job was so big that Moses couldn't do it effectively and the people couldn't be served well. As it says there in verse 18, the thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. No, I think this is wonderful. Because when Moses' own father-in-law came to him and said these words to him, I don't know if you've ever had an in-law say these words to you, the thing which you do is not good. Many people might reject that out of hand. Well, who are you, Mr. Father-in-law or mother-in-law, to tell me what to do? This is my family, and I certainly won't be taking advice from outsiders, especially people who aren't part of the nation of Israel. I'm not going to take your advice. No, so much to his credit, Moses could hear those words and receive something from them. Now, right there, there's something I want to apply to your life and to my life. Is there somebody in your life who can look you in the eye and say, the thing that you do is not good, and you'll listen to them? Really? Or is there nobody in your life that you'll hear that from? Are you really at a place where nobody can tell you what's good or bad for your life except yourself? Everybody else, no, nobody can tell you you're wrong except you. Listen, you and I know, when I put it in those terms, that's not a good place to be in. There must be people in my life and in your life who can look us in the eye and in love tell us, I love you, but you're wrong and you need to reconsider. Moses had that. You need to have it. I need to have it. We need to be sensitive to that. Because we get ourselves, especially in our highly individualistic culture, when we believe that nobody can tell me what's right or wrong, I can only figure it out on myself. Moses was wise enough to say, yes, I hear it from you, my father-in-law Jethro. And he took it to heart carefully. So, the thing that you do is too much for you. You're not able to perform it by yourself. You need to get some godly help. What are you going to do with this? And now, starting at verse 19, Jethro's going to give Moses advice. And I love how he gives the advice, starting here at verse 19. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the law and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Now notice what he says here in verses 19 and 20 because it's very critical. I think that some of you, possibly, you're not listening carefully to me right now because, yeah, I know how the rest of the chapter ends. I've heard this message before. I've read this chapter myself. Moses delegates responsibility to a bunch of leaders. They do the job of judging. Great, I got it. No, you don't get it. Now, I don't know if you've carefully read this. I don't know if you've really got the keys in verses 19 and 20. In verses 19 and 20, he gives Moses two important things that had to happen before he ever delegated. What did he have to do before he ever delegated? Notice, first of all, he had to pray. Verse 19, stand before God for the people. That means, Moses, you need to pray for the entire congregation of Israel, even if you can't personally be the one who serves them in every need that they have. And that's so important for anybody who leads a group of God's people. I read this and I say, it's important for me. That even if I'm not going to be the one to counsel everybody, even if I'm not going to be the one to personally disciple everybody, even if that work is going to be delegated through people, both staff and both people who are lay people throughout the congregation, I need to be the one who will come before the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, would you please move in our congregation? Would you bless and teach and do it both in generally and then specific people that come to my mind and heart to pray for? Moses, just because you delegate the responsibility, it doesn't mean that you stop praying for the nation. Number one, you stand before God for the people. But then there's another aspect. Did you see it there in verse 20? Teach them the statutes and the laws. You see, for Moses to effectively lead, for this whole delegation thing to work, he had to teach the word of God, not only to those people who would hear the disputes, but also to those who might dispute. Moses, you've got to teach the word of God to the people. 
Before you delegate, before you give away, have that foundation where you, Moses, are a teacher of the nation and they learn the principles of the word of God. You better pray and you better teach and you better give it concrete and examples. You see what it says at the end of verse 20? Show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. I think that that show them means two things. Number one, he, he had to give them practical examples how to do it, but number two, he had to be a practical example. Live it out, Moses. So Moses, you got to pray and you got to teach. Do that before anything else. You see, if the people knew God's word for themselves, many of those disputes could just be settled immediately. You know, that whole dispute between whose sheep belongs to who and on and on and all that kind of fighting. If the people knew the principles of the word of God, they could say, well, okay, Let's not say you're right. Let's not say I'm right. Let's say the word of God is right and apply it to our lives. Now, do you imagine how many things would get cleared up and would never need to be brought to a judge at all? Because the people knew the word of God and they could apply it to their own situations. Also, they would not be discouraged by the delays that happen. They believe, yes, we can get these things settled among ourselves. You know, in all this, there's a very clear analogy between the leadership of Moses for Israel and the leadership of a pastor among God's people. Now, please listen to me. That analogy does not fit at every point, but it does fit in many aspects. Do you recognize this? That this whole thing in the book of Exodus chapter 18 could only work if God was recognized as the true leader of Israel. That's why they gave such an exalted place to the word. Because it had to be established that when Moses gave a judgment, it wasn't his own authority. It wasn't because Moses said it. It was because the Lord said it. And then those delegated judges, it wasn't because they said it. It was because the Lord said it. All of this was a way of recognizing back and again that it is the Lord who's the true leader. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what has to be recognized in this congregation and in every church that names the name of Jesus Christ. It has to be acknowledged. Jesus Christ is the leader. He is the head of the church. He is the master of his own body. So that's one principle. But here's another principle, is that the leader cannot do the work of leadership alone and should not do the work of leadership alone. Think about how it was in Israel before Moses delegated things. There was a vast untapped potential of people who needed to be activated for what they could do. There were skilled and wise and discerning men who could be put into action and their work could be recognized and appreciated among Israel. Those men weren't being used until Moses said, I can delegate this. And so Moses just couldn't or shouldn't be doing the work of leadership alone. I would say that there's probably rare, rare instances where God calls a man to do leadership alone, but almost always it's in the context of a team recognizing that Jesus Christ is the leader of all. Thirdly, it's as true back then as it is now that a leader has a special responsibility for prayer and teaching of God's people, that that's absolutely essential. He can't meet every need. Some of that has to be delegated, but he has to give a primacy to those ministries of prayer and teaching uh, God's word. But then also that the people, excuse me, that the leader must train and select and give authority to people who help him in the work. And that's exactly what's going to happen in the following verses. Uh, on that point, I like what uh, Charles Spurgeon said on this. He said, quote, the Christian pastor is in some respects comparable to Moses, for he is set apart as a leader in the band of brethren, and as such his business is not only to teach the people, but to plead for them with God. If there's any point where we would make this analogy between a pastor and Moses, it better be this, pastor, you better be praying for your people, and you better be teaching them God's word, even as Moses was commissioned to do. But that's not all. Look at it here, verse 21. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge, so it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. 
Isn't that beautiful? Moses, what are you doing thinking that it should be one sort of one-man show? Don't do that. Look around in Israel. The people will help you. They will bring to you able men such as fear God and who are men of truth. Find these men, pour into them, delegate unto them the work. And I like how these men are described. In verse 21, they're described as able men. That means they're men of ability. They're also described as such as fear God. That means they're men of godliness. They're also described as being men of truth. I think that means that they speak the truth, but it also means that they love God's word. And fourthly, they're men who hate covetousness. They are men of honor. Find those men. Give them responsibility. Entrust to them real work of the ministry, and you'll see what happens. Now, at the last part of Jethro's advice to Moses, I want you to look carefully what he says in verse 23. He says, if you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all these people will go to their place in peace. You see that first thing he says to Moses and he goes, Moses, I've given you this advice. Pray about it. See if God commands you to do this. And I find this fascinating because let's face it, Jethro was an outsider. Jethro wasn't part of Israel. Jethro wasn't a tribal leader, or one of the chieftains or anything like that among the community of Israel. This wasn't advice that came from Joshua. This wasn't advice that came from Aaron. This wasn't advice that came from somebody else in the camp of Israel. He was an outsider. Jethro recognized that. He also recognized that, and I don't know if these are the right words. If it's not the right words, just forgive me and hear my heart on this. This is somewhat of a business model, isn't it? You know, just sort of this structure and do it and administrate it this way. And that's why he says, listen, Moses, take this if you want, but please don't take it because it's my plan. Don't take it just because it seems smart. You take it to God in prayer and see that he wants it for Israel at this time. And I think that's absolutely critical because Moses couldn't call back and just say, well, Jethro told me to do it. No, no, Moses, you got to be confident. This is what the Lord wants you to do. So that was very important. You know, sometimes we'll guide, God will guide us from unusual and outside sources. But friends, confirm it by prayer to the very best of your ability. Moses did that, and the benefit was going to be this. First of all, you will be able to endure. That's what it says in verse 23. And then in verse 23, it also says that all the people will go their place in peace. The people would be more effectively served. People wouldn't have to wait months and, and weeks and weeks to get their disputes settled. They could get their disputes settled much more quickly because we know it's often true that just as delayed is just as denied. Instead, they could get things addressed much more quickly. So it's a win-win. Moses endures. The people are served much better. Great. Let's go forward with this. Verse 24. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. Then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. Well, verse 24 tells us, Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. Why? Well, because he sought the Lord about it. And he sensed that this is what the Lord wants. It's not just because it's my father-in-law's advice, but it's because what the Lord really wants. And he wisely followed Jethro's counsel, and this extended his ministry and his life. Do you recognize at this point, Moses has about... 40 years of good ministry left in him. I don't know if he would have had five more years of good ministry left in him if he would have continued at the pace he was going. And so this saved Moses' life. It extended his ministry. It gave him so much more fruitful work to do. But that isn't the only place that it was a blessing. It's true that it was good for Moses. Moses could focus on the most important things and not be overwhelmed or overstressed by many smaller tasks. That's a good thing. But I'll tell you another place that it was very good. It was good for the leaders that they chose. Did you see that in verse 25? 
They chose rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. Think about all those men throughout all the congregation of Israel who now had important work to do for God's community. That was an untapped resource before, but no longer is it untapped. Now those men have ministry pushed down to them. It's not like all the ministry was running back up to Moses, but Moses was pushing it down to people who could receive it, people who could do it, people who could run with it, and it was good for those people who were now given meaningful work to the kingdom of God. And ladies and gentlemen, that's such a true principle. You know, sometimes I fear, I, I, I fear that, that in a congregation such as ours, that the message is communicated. It would never be openly said, never. But sometimes unconsciously it's communicated that I'm the one doing the important work. You know, this is what's really important. What other people do or what you might do serving, Lord, well, that's not so important. This is the important work. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you, I believe with all my heart that what I do is important. And I like it. Sometimes I just, get, I just get so deeply touched. I go, thank you, Lord, that I get to teach people who actually want to hear God's word. It's such a blessing. I love it week after week. But not for a moment do I think, or should you think, or should anybody think that there's some hierarchy of importance and somehow what I do is important, but what other people do is, well, that's just sort of peripheral. Ladies and gentlemen, we are a body. And each part has an important role to play. And what Moses was doing is he's saying, I'm going to focus on the things that I do most focused and most importantly, and I'm going to give that other work for them to exercise their important functions. And now there were hundreds, if not thousands of men throughout all of Israel now raised up to do important work for the furtherance of God's community. It was good for those leaders. So it was good for Moses. It was good for the leaders he raised up, but may I raise a third point? It was also good for the congregation. There's the congregation of Israel. Moses is praying for them. Moses is teaching for them. But now, with all these delegated leaders, they are more able to settle disputes than ever before. They receive quicker attention and better attention from the delegated leaders than from Moses. Which would you rather have to hear your case? A judge? who hears three cases a day, or a judge who hears 40 cases a day. Good luck if you're number 40 on that list. The judge would sort of just say, well, whatever, you guys figure it out and walk away. None of the people received much better attention, and that was a good thing. I love what D.L. Moody said on this point. D.L. Moody said, it is better to set a hundred men to work than to do the work of a hundred men. And that's a beautiful principle, and that's how it should be in the body of Christ. Well, I'll draw to a close here, but I just can't resist, before I end, to say, what does this tell us about God's work today, and where do we see Jesus in any of this? You, you hear me say that, don't you? That when we make our way through Exodus, we should all be looking for Jesus in the book of Exodus. And you might be thinking, oh, now, now you're stumped, David. Where do you find Jesus in Exodus chapter 18? Please, do you doubt me that I cannot find Jesus in Exodus 18? No, no, no. Ladies and gentlemen, was there ever a greater delegator than Jesus himself? There's Jesus speaking with his apostles on the Mount of Olives before he ascends to heaven. He's already done his great sacrificial work on the cross where he died a bloody death on the cross to pay for our sins. And he's already given them the, the, the power from his resurrected life. They are touched. They're filled with the Spirit. They're awaiting that greater filling on the day of Pentecost. But the disciples are already deeply touched by the work of the crucified and resurrected Jesus. But before he ascends to heaven, he has a little meeting with them on the Mount of Olives. And what does he tell them? He tells them, you guys are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. I am passing this work on to you. I'm going to ascend to heaven. And just like Moses was to pray for the people and teach the people, does not our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ pray for us from heaven? Does he not teach us through the Holy Spirit even now? And so Jesus is there praying for his people, teaching his people, but he delegates the work unto us. 
Do you see how important it is for us to say, thank you, Jesus. You have given me some place in advancing your kingdom. Now, I can't speak to you for exactly what your place is, but I, if you don't know, if you have no clue at what God has given you to do in advancing his kingdom, would you just ask him about that? Because I believe that every Christian should have some intentional way that they are advancing the work of God's kingdom. Maybe that intentional way is going to be by serving at something in the congregation. You're going to serve in children's ministry. You're going to be a part of the missions ministry. You're going to be a part of this or that or something else. Sometimes the way we advance God's kingdom is by serving him some way outside of the church's walls or ministries. But listen, what's most important is that every Christian say, Jesus has dealt delegated this to me, and I'm going to carry on that work. Jesus is the great delegator, but, but, every great delegator knows that there's some things that you can't delegate. When it came time for somebody to go up on Mount Sinai and receive the commandments of God, did Moses delegate that? Not on your life. He said, this is my calling, my job. And if we look at Jesus Christ to be the great delegator, ladies and gentlemen, there's at least one work. I'm not saying it's the only one, but there's at least one notable work that he could not delegate. It's that great work that he did of dying on the cross and paying the penalty for our sins. He alone could do that. That's not something that you could do for yourself, nor could you do it for somebody else. Oh, I know your heart may be filled with love for your children, with love for your neighbors, with love for people in your family. And if you could die to pay the penalty for your sins, you would do it. But I tell you, you can't. That's a work that cannot be delegated. Only the sinless Son of God could do that for us. He did that work that could not be delegated so stop trying to do it for yourself or for anybody else. Receive it only from him. And that leads us to now, where in the remainder of our time this morning, we're going to focus on two things. We're going to focus on worshiping the God who loves us so much. And secondly, on remembering this work that Jesus did for us at the Lord's table. And it's my great pleasure because we're going to worship God in just a moment in song. But we're also going to invite up our good friend Jay Cardi, to come and lead us in remembering Jesus and his great work for us at the Lord's table. Let's pray together. Father, Jesus, we thank you that, that you have delegated this great work to us. You have, Lord, there's so much you've given us to do, to be your witnesses, to preach your gospel, to live lives of service and love and good deeds for this community. Lord, we know it, we believe it, we receive it. We don't want to shirk from the responsibility that you've delegated to us. But Jesus, we are. We're so aware that there's some things that can't be delegated. And cleansing our sin can't be delegated. You alone could do it. Purchasing our lives, filling us with the Holy Spirit, adopting us into your family. These are things that we could never do. But you, you, as our great Savior, have done them for us. So draw our focus unto you. Prepare us to receive from your table. And pour out your grace upon us in Jesus' name. Amen.